Hello, welcome to one more lecture on our fundamentals and biomedical application of quantum science and engineering. Last lecture, uh, I was presenting to you a very important and interesting uh, concept, which is the concept of photon. You know, uh, light normally is like wave, and uh, the experiments or the observations of some phenomena of nature uh, put to us that actually uh, light uh, behavior like particle in many in many situations and those particles of light uh, or particle behavior of light we call photons you know you have to understand that uh, when we speak about wave we normally have to understand something that uh, varies in space and time and occupies a space that's allowed. This is fundamental, right? Waves occupy the space and has conditions on the boundaries that uh, where it's confined. On the other hand, when we speak about particle, we speak, we basically speaking about uh, momentum, uh, which is the composition of mass and velocity and motion and energy. This is what we are speaking. If you remember all the mechanics you learn is based on those concepts, is based on variation of uh, energy or even conservation of energy and variation of momentum, linear momentum, and also angular momentum. We did not input yet, or we did not introduce yet in this contest, angular momentum, but we're gonna do soon. So you see, we have a particle and wave that normally physics characterizes and deal with in a very specific way. But here we have something that's fully wave, and this comes from uh, many, many concepts, Euler, many, many people around uh, the development of science that uh, demonstrate uh, the wave characteristic of uh, the light. And of course, as we learned in the last, uh, last lecture, Maxwell, explain to us waves of what? what? What are the waves of light made of? And then uh, Maxwell was uh, brilliantly demonstrate that uh, the, the light are waves of electricity and magnetism, that's what we call electromagnetic waves. And uh, this has been a solid concept for very long. Okay. Now, uh, if we have to make a statement about uh, what we did in the last lecture, we can say that after discovering that waves are like particles in the understanding of the black body radiation or the radiation emitted by heated bodies, and uh, the ob you know to obtain or to understand the Planck's law, which seems to be very well connected with reality, it explains well everything, we have to introduce the concept of photons, of photons, I'm sorry, uh, which is uh, this package of energy that uh, behavior like particle in light type of phenomena. Okay, now, there is a, a normal question that you may ask at the moment, which is, uh, if uh, wave behavior like particles, if we have a behavior of wave for particles, which is, as I, as I told you before, and I'm like insisting in those concepts because they will be very useful. So if we have a, a traditional wave characterized by frequency and wavelength, now behaving like a particle, so all these wavelengths it helps to determine a momentum that is conserved or not during interaction. We saw effects where it is conserved and effects where it is not conserved. And the frequency which is converted in energy. So we made this arrow here. We made this arrow and then we established a relation between wave and particle, starting with the wave type of phenomenon. Now you may ask, which is a legitimate question, 
is is there a arrow going that way or if somehow I, I'm dealing with particles are they behaving like waves too so is this a kind of common or universal behavior in nature and so this is a legitimate question right because if a wave behave like particle maybe particle will behave like wave and this question is not we are not the first one to 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 place it it was placed long ago by a very important uh, french physicist louis de broglie so if you if we can revert the arrow then uh, we are like discovering a very important uh, property of nature and you know in nature normally it is not fully asymmetric you know, when things go from here to here, always there is something comes from there to here. And we want to know this reversibility. If when we detecting particles, are we, or when we, we dealing with particles or with concept of particles that normally we learn in physics, are we also having the wave behavior introduced and for some reason we did not pay attention enough or something? Okay. So this question, uh, of course, the answer is yes, you, you're going to see during this lecture. But uh, you have to understand that we observe, we're going to construct the quantum mechanics up to those concepts, but we don't, we don't know why, you know. You cannot ask in this course, you know, why, you know, you can, but there'll be no directly answer because we are in a contest that we use quantum mechanics more than we explain why matter is behaving that way. Why electromagnetic wave that has interference, that has diffraction, which is normally wave type of uh, phenomena, also behavior like particles when we observe the photon electron effect or the Compton effect or even the radiation emitted by bodies. Okay, so Louis de Broglie, he placed an hypothesis of wave matter. He just established that not only the waves present characteristics of particle, but particles also present characteristics of wave. That's something that's a very strong, right? And uh, you have to start to observe for particles uh, the behavior of waves and uh, normally they are not there and by the way when we speak about waves that are depending on the relation between uh, dimensions that we are dealing with and the wavelength we may have what we call the geometric part of the waves propagation like the geometric optics where the wave in nature is not really relevant or we have the physical optics where the, the electromagnetic oscillations are, are really important. The wave really manifests itself in a very important way. Okay, so De Broglie basically is trying to help us to reverse this arrow. So he's trying to tell us that this is possible. If you have a particle in one side, maybe you can make the correlation. And you know, the Planck's relation of energy and momentum that uh, I introduced to you before, because it is a relativistic type of uh, relation. If in a particle has energy, we have also momentum following the relativity, the special relativity. Then it's easy to establish what should be the wavelength of a particle if the particle is going to show any wave type of behavior. Okay, so uh, that this is the contest and the name De Broglie is now going to be marked to us. It's, it's a very important name because the De Broglie constructs the matter waves. He constructs matter uh, waves of mass, particle, massive particles, right? So this is very important. So as I said to you, particles with energy E 
and momentum p, which is normally the quantities that we deal with particles, can have frequency and uh, wavelength, which is characteristic of waves. What is the relation of that? De Broglie just made an analogy. He looked to the Planck's uh, analogy. He looks to what Planck has discovered in nature. And he just said, okay, you know, we, Planck proposed that uh, if I had a particle or if I have a wave of wavelength L, a lambda, there should be associated with it a momentum and an energy, of course. Uh, so De Broglie made the opposite. He said, look, if there is a particle with momentum, so now there is a particle moving with momentum P, and of course P can be MV for a particle moving, there is associated with this particle a wave with wavelength lambda, which is called the De Broglie wavelength. And the relation between the wavelength and the momentum with De Broglie, you know, just to visualize from Planck's relation, is given by this. So a particle with momentum P will have, uh, will behave, if behavior like wave, the wave has to have, or this is a hypothesis, right? as we prove it, has a wavelength that is h, the Planck's constant, which we know is very small, is on the order of 10 to the minus 34 joules uh, second, right? And uh, this is small, so this is small, you know, so don't think that we're going to walk in the corridor of the department and diffract by the walls. It, that's happened, but in a, in a level that's tiny, tiny, tiny that we cannot observe. Okay, so this is the big uh, beginning of the quantum concepts, is giving to mass particles the behavior of wave. And that was done, you see, in a hypothesis, because, uh, well, if one behavior like that, if you Waves are like particles in many sense. Particles must be like wave in other sense. And uh, it, this is changing a, a lot the way we're going to describe things. Now, the big question is, when is that important, right? Is that important everywhere? As I told you, when I walk to a, corrid a narrow corridor, because we know that waves propagate in narrow space, it, it, it is going to diffract when it has a chance. So when you, when you pass to a door, it's a narrow, I'm in a big corridor, I pass to the door of the department, and what I see? I see diffraction. I don't see diffraction of myself, or a ball, or anything, right? When I go speak with the director, I pass through the, the door of the, of the office of the director, I don't diffract, <laughs> you know. He can see me very well, I'm not going anywhere, spreading. So, we have to understand when this is, should be applied, when this should be observed, okay? Very good. So, I'm going to take an example that everybody understands. Let's take a tennis ball. You know, if you take a tennis ball, a tennis is like a fraction of kilo of mass. The velocity can be like, what, 10 meters per second most. And uh, I go, I use the value of the Planck's constants that I already provided to you on the last lecture, okay? And I calculate, what is the De Broglie wavelength? By the way, normally we call this De Broglie wavelength because it's the wave, it's the, the, the character, wave characteristic of a particle which has some momentum and mass, right? That works very well for for massless particles, because that was the big proof of uh, Planck's law for radiation. Now here, if I do this, I get a very small number. I get that for the wave, the De Broglie wavelength for a tennis ball, a tennis ball, is 10 to the minus 24 angstrom. Wow! 
That's the small. If you know the, the, the tennis ball is like, uh, I will say, 7 to 10 centimeters in diameter, here to observe that the tennis ball is like wave, that wave will be in a range of wavelength that's 10 to the minus 24 angstrom. 10 to the minus 24 angstrom is dummy small. Remember, the atom itself is like angstrom. So this is kind of a scale or dimension in your mind. 10 to the minus 24 angstrom is really small. Well, and uh, you know, to have uh, what we call diffraction, to have uh, interference, to have those things that normally behave to belongs to waves, we needed to make the wave to interact with the structures, with the dimensions, or typ typical dimensions, or typical variations, or typical scale, the way we say, are on the order of wavelength. What I mean on the order means, you know, around, it cannot be many thousand wavelengths and cannot be also many, uh, one over a thousand of wavelengths. It has to be on the order. So normally when we have a wave and the wave interacts with things that are around that dimension, wow, the, the wave um, uh, ma manifests itself by big diffraction. Okay, so to have the phenomena normally associated with waves, we need to make the wave to interact with structures that are normally typically on the size of the wavelength. Right? Imagine a tennis ball, and the tennis ball is bouncing in a wall. Imagine the wall has some ondulation, okay? This ondulation can be of uh, millimeters, can be of centimeters, can be about the size of the ball, but, but also can be meters. And then I, I see the behavior of the ball. Everybody knows when I throw a ball in a smooth surface, it's like a reflection. It preserves momentum in all directions and everything. So you bounce and the same angle. It's like a, a, a geometric type of reflection. If the ondulation on the wall is on the order of the ball size, boy, depending where the ball interacts, this will go everywhere, right? And I will never be able to determine if there was an ondulation on the wall by bouncing a ball, a tennis ball, if the ondulation is like millimeters. But if it is on the size compatible with the ball, I will see effect. If it is meters, I will not see the effect either because it's too big. This is in optics, is what we call the domain or the limit of the geometric optics. Everybody learns geometric optics. And geometric optics happens when lambda divided by the typical dimension of what you're doing goes to zero. The ratio goes to zero. So all the imperfection of a, a mirror has to be much, much bigger than the wavelength. Because if it is on the order of the wavelength, it turns out that we see diffraction. That's why we have diffraction gratings, which is a kind of uh, grooves spaced and uh, not very far from the wavelength. Because when that happens, the wave will partially interact with each of those structures and the diffraction and the interference will take place. So, big objects, the wavelengths are so small that we will need the structure that are tiny, tiny, and we don't have that available all the time to observe that. So, normally, in the macroscopic world, we could never guess that uh, the De Broglie hypothesis is true, we will say that, no, no, it's not true. But we are in another regime when we're dealing with those big objects. We have to go to a regime, or we have to go to structures that are much smaller, that are on the order of the wavelength of the particle that we're dealing with. So, 
we want to find situations where the ratio between the de Broglie wavelength of the particle we are considering and the typical dimensions or the typical structure is on the order of unit. If we deal with the tennis ball, we'll not be able to do it. There is nothing that uh, I know that will have this dimension. Oh, there are things that has those dimensions, but it's not easy to go and interact with them. Now, let's take the particle that's the most common particle for us. You know, because we know matter is made of um, atoms. Atoms are made of electron and, uh, and protons and everything. But electrons are the movable particles, right? So let's consider the electrons. We're going to deal with electrons now. Let's take electrons. And then I'm going to accelerate an electrons, give it to the electrons, the energy compatible with 100 volts. As you know, the product of the charge times the voltage is the energy. We learned that in all freshman courses of physics, right? And then uh, if I ask, what is the wavelength for an electron? I know the mass of the electron is everywhere. And if I ask, what is the de Broglie wavelength for the, that electron? Well, you do the, the calculation. You know now the, the size of the Planck constants. You know the mass of the electron. You know the energy or the, or the momentum that's compatible with 100 electron volts of energy. I hope you know how to deal with electron volts. It's just the charge times voltage, right? This uh, is easy to do. Uh, it turns out that for that conditions, the wavelength is about an angstrom. And about an angstrom is the size of the atom. And the electron is in, in the atom. We know that. You know? At the moment in the course, we don't know where the electron is, how it is. But that's a situation where if there is any manifestation of wave for the electron, that's the adequate situation. Because the size of the atom is exactly on the order of the de Broglie wavelength there. As you know, all the energy of the electrons is on the order of electron volts. You remember 13 times 0.6 electron volts, the ground state, and the Hartree, which is 27 times a 0.2 electron volts, that's the typical energy. It's in this order, the energy of the electron in the atom. Therefore, the momentum must be on the order of this. So the electron inside the atom is our main object. Because uh, there, I, we are sure that, you know, if there is any manifestation of wave for the particle behavior, it's in the atom. And you all know that quantum mechanics was mostly established to explain the atom, right? And today we do everything, so uh, it's true. And that's the reason, you know? The reason is that uh, in that structure, the, the, the wavelength of this particle, co-electron, is really amazing. It's the same. It's on the same order. Therefore, we cannot avoid treating the electron as particle when we are in the atom or treating the electron as wave as well, when we are in the atom. But there were, there, there were many experiments proving that just free electrons traveling in a beam really behave like waves. And those are the experiments that we're going to do now. Atoms are on the right dimension to us. But if you remember the solids, they are also very nice. You know, we use X-ray to be diffract on the, on the crystals, because the wavelength of the X-ray is on the order of the space between the sizes or the traditional dimension, spatial dimension between atoms in the solid. That's why we use uh, X-ray to determine structure of crystals, molecules, DNA, and so on. It's because uh, we are in the right dimension. And there, the X-ray, which is wave, electromagnetic wave, diffracts, and by looking at the diffraction, we can go back and understand the spacing and everything. So people decided to do the same with the electrons. And the first experiment they did is done by Davidson and Germer. They say, well, let's produce an electron beam and let's shoot this on a crystal. 
a crystal that we know more or less the structure, and this is a lithium fluorite. That's the one they chose. And how you make an electron beam? You make a filament, you heat up the filament, so you put a voltage here to heat up the filament. The filament, hot filament, is emitting electrons. And this is well known from electronics and from everything. Now, I want to give a precise energy to the electrons. So what I do then, I make this filament to produce the electrons, but I create a grid in some specific voltage. So I apply a voltage between the filament and the grid. So the electron must acquire an energy that's depending on this voltage. And I put here how many electron volts I want of energy to the electron. If I apply 50 volts in this grid, electron has to emerge from here with 50 electron volts of energy and so on. And then I shoot the electrons. Here comes the electron beam. Boom. On the crystal surface. And uh, from the crystal surface, they will scatter everywhere. And I put a detector that has an angle. And I measure the electrons that are reaching the detector. And I observe that. I can vary the voltage fixing the angle. Or I can fix the voltage, which means fixing the energy, fixing the momentum of the electron beam, and varying the angle. Right? So I can either fix the angle and vary the energy, or I can fix the energy and vary the angle. So that means fixing the momentum or varying the momentum of the electron beam. And what do we observe? We should observe a kind of things everywhere. But no, we observe the signal that we observe. It has clear minimums and maximums, depending on the energy. Remember, varying the energy means that we are varying the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of the electron. I fix the angle, 50 degrees. Could be any other one. And I do that in many angles too, to, to make sure things work well. And by varying the, the, the lambda, I see maximum and minimums, depending on the voltage I put for a fixed angle. This is exactly like shooting an uh, electromagnetic wave of many different wavelengths. And I'm going to have a maximum and minimums in different wavelengths. This is what's happening with the diffraction grating, right? I shoot the white light, and they split. And I see the colors with maximum in different places. It's exactly what's happening here. I'm seeing this phenomenon. And this gives an indication. If I treat this problem, just treating the particles as the electrons, as particles, I will not observe the maximum and minimums. I just observe a lot of things going in different places, maybe a distribution, but not maximum and minimums varying the energy. There is no reason for that in the classical physics or in the particle physics. This is giving indication that as I, as I vary the wavelength, is like matching the condition for the maximum of interference or the minimum of interference of those electrons, depending on the spacing of the crystal. But I'm not happy with that only. I'm going to do more than that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take now the electron beam. I'm going to fix the momentum of the electron beam. I'm going to fix the voltage or the energy, which means now I have a fixed momentum or I have a fixed de Broglie wavelength, and I'm going to vary the angle. Exactly like we do when we study diffraction, right? We send a monochromatic light, and we see. And uh, well, you can guess what we're going to observe. We're going to observe also maximum and minimum. Here, I'm trying to be as quantitative as possible, but you know, you should not take very much this and 
I try to reproduce from the papers of uh, Germer uh, the, the data, but uh, it is, you see, you're gonna see maximum and minimum may be a little more noisy and things like this. So, the presence of minimums and maximum in those experiments that we have just done really, really show to us that there is interference taking place and therefore the wave characteristic, the wave characteristic for this electron beam is showing itself in this situation. I just want to explain you a little more what's going on there so you understand the diffraction. You, you all hear about Bragg diffraction, which is what we do with X-rays, right? We have a crystal. This crystal has a kind of periodicity, which is what I call the traditional dimension, right? And then I send a, a, a beam of X-ray. This is a traditional Bragg scattering. I'm gonna make an analogy for you to understand. So when you, 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 you send the, the, the beam, the beam is a wave that goes, part of it is interacting with the first layer of the crystal, part of it is interacting with the second layer, and they scatter, they come to some angle. They come to many angles, but I'm choosing one angle to analyze. And then there will be even part coming from the third layer of atoms in this crystal and propagate. If you look, this is from the same waves, like a partial reflection here, a partial reflection here, and so on. And we're gonna do light matter interaction in part in some part of the course, so you'll be understanding more how this thing happens. If, you, if we analyze now the situation, just putting this part, you're gonna see that the beam that reflects on the second plane has traveled a little more by this quantity of compare with the beam, and I consider the angle phi here, okay? And the beam that reflects on the second plane, it travels a little more uh, extra path than the ones that uh, interact with the first and reflects. If you calculate, this is just a regular geometry, if you calculate what is this difference of path, it is, two times the spacing, D, between the planes, times the sine of the angle that I'm considering. This is the path difference. But when it comes to the detector here, these things will come together. And if you want to travel more than the other, this is like displacing one wave. You know, this is the same wave. And then when one travel more than the other, I displace. Maximum and minimums do not agree anymore. They don't coincide in space. But uh, if it's for some reason they match again, displace it, they add up. That's the constructive interference, right? When uh, I displace that, they come into the middle. This is the destructive condition. They disappear. I mean the minimum of the signal. So, if this is an incher number of wavelength, means that I just went from this situation to this situation. I displace by an incher number of wavelength, and they agree, again, they coincide maximums with maximums. And if I ask for this condition, for the energy 5, 54 electron volts, which is precise, I determine precise what's the wavelength of the electron, following the De Broglie hypothesis, and I consider the first maximum observed, right, on this process, I can come to this expression, n equal to 1, because n has to be an incher number, means that the, the, the dephasing is uh, compatible to an incher number of wavelength, that's the condition for constr constructive interference. Now, if I come and I do the calculation in the experiment of Davidson Germer, considering the interplane, atomic plans of the fluoride crystal, lithium fluoride crystal, I observe the first maximum and I determine that lambda is 1.65 angstrom. 
Well, you see, they are the same order, right? Now, if I use the energy, I use the energy that I, I gave it to the electron beam, which is 54 electron volts, and I determine using De Broglie relation, I found exactly 1.65 angstroms of wavelength, exactly the same. So this is a dumb interesting coincidence because it shows that actually the electron beam is a wave propagating, interacting with the crystal, the way I told you. And this interaction provides the interference phenomenon, like the diffraction of X-ray in the crystal, right? Like Bragg diffraction. So that was a very important, and then there was many other experiments. You know, even uh, there was many other scientists that came with proofs to really certify that electrons actually, when interacting with the structures that are compatible to, with the de Broglie wavelength, they behave like waves. That creates a very important thing. Because the detector clicks for each electron. When I detect the electron, I detect one particle. Electronics know how to do that. But the behavior of the interaction of the electrons with the crystal is like wave. So that creates a very important concept, which is the concept of duality wave particle for electrons and many other things. And the, the De Broglie wavelength is a good relation. And of course, the frequency related to the energy is as well, because if for the free electrons, they are well compact. They are well connected. Of course, there is a, a, main, a main question here. You are detecting waves of what? Because uh, as we know, they knew that the light in the history, they knew that the light was waves, but they didn't know of what. That took many years, many decades, maybe centuries, for people to realize that light was waves of electricity and magnetism. Maxon was the master of this, right? And now we are asking the same question. If the electron is behavior like wave, we are dealing with what kind of wave? So the big question is wave of what, right? If it is a wave, but uh, before, we, we're going to respond to this question. Wave of what? We know the characteristic of the wave. We, we must understand that what is the amplitude of what, right? Because it's mass, well, what is that? We have to understand that. But uh, just keep this question in mind. I'm going to answer the interpretation that's given to this is wave of what? But we have a wave. And if we have a wave, we can apply what we know about wave, the mathematical description of a wave, to really construct a wave function. Because if you have a wave, we don't deal with uh, momentum and, uh, and uh, energy only. We do with the wave, because we're going to see, we're going to have to deal with the, some uh, description of this wave. And wave occupies more than a single point in space, right? So we have to construct what we call a wave function. And if you have a wave that has lambda and E, you know, the wave is simple. As I explained to you in your tutorial or in your review, the wave is actually something that has the spatial variation and the time variation. And the spatial variation is characterized by lambda and the time variation by the frequency. Of course, because we're going to express as a periodic function, like the sine here, a trigonometric function, we have to come with the 2 pi to work with uh, angular quantities, not uh, the absolute quantities of wavelength. That is no sine of meters, but that is sines of had radians. And this is what we convert by writing that way. If we forget about time, this is a wave with periodicity of lambda. And if we forgot about space, this is a wave with periodicity of new in time. 
So we're going to start to construct mathematically ways of dealing with this wave, and we call wave function. So instead of describing the things by the momentum or the r, the position as a function of time, as we do with particles all the time in classical mechanics, instead of doing this, now we have to migrate to wave function. And of course, we have to know how to prepare this wave function. We have to know how, what conditions has to be applied to this wave function. This is what we call a plan wave. It's a wave that's everywhere in space. But uh, we know that uh, that doesn't happen. Most part of the time, the wave is localized and everything. So we got to modify a couple of things here. But we can at least say, well, the electron, instead of having a R of t, which is a trajectory, it has now a wave function that describes its occupation in the space and time. If I consider that for the electron beam, I explain all my observations. But the question of waves of what still remain. And along the few lectures, I have to decide if the next lecture we're going exactly to explain the wave or let's build up a little more concepts of wave. And then we explain waves of what. Okay? Well, very nice. Thank you for seeing the lecture. I hope you understand it well. And I see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye. <music>